All right. Great to see y'all. I know you're probably trying to do a lot of catch up uh, as you're talking and connecting with others. You, you haven't had a chance to talk all year long. Uh, that, that joke went over great. Um, but it's great to see you guys. I have not seen y'all all year long. No, not the second time. You guys are giving me a hard time for using these dad jokes, but honestly, this is the first time all year I've used that joke. All right. It was the middle of World War II, and Hiru Anada decided he was going to join the Japanese army. He started training and trained for two years in intelligence, guerrilla warfare, in covert operations and martial arts. After two years of training, he then went to uh, deploy to the Philippine island, this small, small island in the Philippines. And when he got there, his orders were to, at all costs, prevent an enemy attack and stop the enemy from invading this island. He arrives on the island and his commanding officer uh, showed up and said, these are your final orders. Stand and fight. Under no circumstances should you surrender or take your life. And so the battle began on this small Philippine island called Lubang. And only 64 days after he arrived, two short months, all but three other Japanese soldiers were either killed or surrendered. So Anoda and three, these three other soldiers headed for the hills. Uh, they went up to the hills and carried out their guerrilla activities and even engaged in some police shootouts. But in October of 1945, Anoda and these three soldiers saw a leaflet announcing that Japan had surrendered. Not long after that, they found another leaflet that was left behind by one of the civilians of the island, which said the war ended on August the 15th, come down from the mountain. But this whole time as they were reading this, they just thought it was a trick from the Allied forces. They believed that they wouldn't have been fired on if the war was actually over. And after hiding in the mountains for over a year, World War II had been over and finished for an entire year. Leaflets were dropped by air with a surrender order printed from the general of the Japanese army. Anoda and these three other soldiers read the leaflets very closely. They studied the language, and as they read it, they still believed it was just a trick. Through the coming months, the other three soldiers were killed in a, a skirmish. And Anoda was left alone until February the 20th, 1975, 29 years after the war was over. A civilian by the name of Noriku Suzuki went to the island to search for three things. He went as a civilian searching for Anoda, a panda, and the abominable snowman, like you do. After four days of searching for Anoda, this civilian found Anoda, and yet Anoda still refused to surrender, saying that he was waiting for orders from his superior officer. And so Anoda took a photo with this civilian, and the civilian took the photo back to Japan, and he found this commanding officer who almost 30 years prior had given his final orders to Hiro Anoda. And he found Major Taniguchi at a Barnes and Noble, showed him the picture, and they flew back to this island where Major Taniguchi met with Lieutenant Anoda and formally relieved him of his duty. Where he turned in his sword, his rifle, with 500 rounds of ammunition, a few hand grenades, and a dagger from his mother. 29 years after, Anoda finally stepped into the reality that the war was over. And I wonder, for, for those of us who are here today, 
you're in the room, you're watching online. I, I wonder how many of us are living like 2,000 years ago, the war ended, that Jesus was victorious, that he offers us the possibility of living fearless and free. How many of us today are still up in the hills even though leaflets are coming down from heaven? I just don't know if I can trust that, that this scripture is true about what I'm walking through. You think, I don't know if this message is for me. And so we choose willingly to continue to live in the chains of hurts, in the bondage of habits, in the prisons of addictions, in the, the grip of fear and despair. But I am here to tell you today, church family, we are announcing that the war is over. Jesus was and is victorious, and today you, we have a chain breaker who has come to set us free. And so over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time in this series called Breakthrough, uh, where we're going to unpack and walk through the pages of Scripture to unpack this truth that there is an invitation and an opportunity for you to experience a breakthrough today. And yet... Even as you hear me say that, I know that many of you still doubt. I just don't know that Jesus would want to do anything with me. I just, I'm just not sure that this good news from Scripture is for me. Because if they really knew me, if they really knew where I've been, if they really knew what I was struggling with right now, if Jesus had any idea of the things that I'm walking through right now, there's no way he'd want anything to do with me. Or maybe you've embraced this truth, this reality that freedom is for you. You've embraced it and, and acknowledged it and experienced it, but maybe there's somebody in your life where you're like, yeah, you know, they're a mess. I just don't know if Jesus could do anything for them. I just don't know if this freedom is really for them because they're a mess and they've been stuck in this rut and they're just spinning their tires. Wherever you're at, whatever side of the mountain that you find yourself on, you may doubt whether it's possible to come down from the mountain, to turn in your weapons and realize that you can surrender to what Jesus has already won for you. I know without a shadow of a doubt today that for many of you, you walked into this room with struggles, with chains, with overwhelming burdens that are weighing you down. And maybe you've heard, maybe you've known, and maybe you've trusted Jesus that the war is over and you've been liberated and you're free and you even sing songs about it and you can quote verses about it, but the reality, reality of this truth is buried under mountains of life that has happened to you. And so this morning, I just want us to, I want us to lay a foundation I want us to, to begin to build out this framework for the coming weeks of how you, yes, you, can experience a breakthrough. So I want to invite you to turn over to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, we catch Jesus and we find Jesus with three of his closest friends. He's with his followers and they've just come down from this amazing, literal mountaintop moment, the transfiguration of Jesus. If there's an ever, ever a moment uh, for us to recognize and realize that Jesus is the Son of God, it's this moment, because this is the moment where literally the heavens open up and God speaks from heaven, this is my Son, listen to him. And so right after this pivotal moment in, in the gospel, we catch up with Jesus and his followers in Mark chapter 9, verse 14. It says this, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, the scribes arguing with them. And immediately the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? Now, I just want us to pause here because this is kind of setting the stage in the context of what's going on in this story. 
And right here, we've got a bit of an appetizer before we get to the main course. And I'm not talking like Applebee's happy hour appetizer where you know that's frozen in some freezer and they just microwave. I'm talking like genuine great appetizer here, tableside risotto. What we see here is that in this moment, Jesus catches the religious leaders arguing, fighting. And I just wonder... Could it be that in some way the arguing that, that we get wrapped around the axle in is, is, is holding us back from what Jesus, because these, these religious leaders here as Jesus shows up, there's a person in need in the crowd. There's somebody in desperate need of experiencing a breakthrough from Jesus and yet all of the church people and all of the religious people, all they can do is argue with each other. And they're so busy arguing that they miss the opportunity to take this kid to Jesus. I, I just wonder, and I'm genuinely asking this, of all of us, and myself included, are there moments that in some way in our own life we can get so busy arguing amongst ourselves that we miss the opportunity to take someone to Jesus? Verse 17. And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they weren't able. And Jesus answered them, O oh, faithless generation. Some translations say the unbelieving generation. Generation. Keep in the back of your mind who is in this crowd, who Jesus is addressing as the faithless generation. Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed in the boy, and he fell on the ground, rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Verse 21, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him. And now this part of the story gives me a little bit of pause uh, because it's at this part of the story where I'm like, wait, wait a minute, Jesus. This boy is having an active seizure. He's foaming at the mouth. He's knocking on death's door. And Jesus uses this moment to take an intake for this boy. Like, Jesus, is this really the moment that you need to check insurance benefits, that you need to get medical history, that this boy is actively knocking on death's door. We might have expected Jesus to say, well, wait, wait, no, 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 no more of this. Let's stop this in the moment, and then I'll get a little bit of history. No. Jesus asks this dad a question. How long has this been going on? And here's what we can't miss today. As we see Jesus pause in the moment, what we can't miss is that Jesus doesn't just show up in this story. Jesus doesn't just show up in, on the scene and snap his fingers and take away all of the pain in this family's life. Jesus doesn't just show up in this story or, or, or in history and just stop all of the evil and all of the atrocities and all of the difficulties that come as part of life. No, Jesus invites this dad into the story, just like he invites you into the story today. And how we respond is key to determining whether we experience a breakthrough of our own that Jesus is inviting us to. Verse 21, Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And his father responded from childhood. And it's often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. Can you imagine as a parent, this is the reality that you walk through. That his son is struggling so much for so long with this thing that has even tried to kill him at times, trying to throw him into the fire, tried to drown him in the water. And Jesus says, uh, uh, actually back up to verse 22, and it's often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But the dad says this, but if... You can do anything. Have compassion on us and help us. 
And Jesus said to him, if you can. I just imagine Jesus is looking around like, did, did you guys hear that he said, if, if you can do anything? If you can, all things are possible for those who believe. I just kind of sense a little bit of frustration from Jesus in this moment. Uh, that he's a little bit frustrated, but he's not aggravated and frustrated with all of the, the evil spirits that are taking over this boy's life. He's not frustrated like, oh, how, how much longer am I going to have to deal with these evil spirits and this uh, demonic nonsense? No, his aggravation, Jesus' frustration is with the religious leaders, his followers. Don't forget that this crowd is made up of Israelite spiritual leaders. These are heavyweights. This is the crowd that Jesus says is the faithless generation. How long do I have to put up with this unbelief? How long do I have to deal with this because everything is possible to him who believes? Notice Jesus doesn't qualify this with any religious activity. Jesus doesn't say everything is possible as long as you know the Bible. Everything is possible as long as you attend church faithfully. Everything is possible as long as there's forward progress in your life. Everything is possible as long as you're not struggling with public sin anymore. No, Jesus says everything is possible to those who believe. Now, uh, just as a caveat, we're, we're not talking about, like, I believe I can fly. It's not this moment where uh, it's just this, uh, this off-the-wall idea, like I prayed, for this, uh, I prayed for this exotic sports car, and now I show up, and it's not in my driveway. That's not, that's not the everything is possible that Jesus is talking about. Do you believe what God can do? According to his word, according to who he is, God is, my Bible says, God is able to do abundantly more than you might ask or think. Jesus says all things are possible for those who believe. Now, this is a pretty bold statement. Uh, this is a pretty radical idea for Jesus to just lob out there. But this, this statement comes back to on the heels of some amazing things that Jesus has done. Just humor me for a minute. Let's rewind for a minute through the Gospels. If you're looking just at Mark alone, and you backtrack a little bit, we see that just before Jesus gets to this moment and says all things are possible, he heals a blind man in Bethsaida. Literally, Jesus spits in his hands, rubs it on his eyes, this blind man's eyes, which is a little bit weird unless you've been blind for a while and then you can see. He does this and then he's healed. Just before that, Jesus fed 4,000. 4,000 from just a few loaves of bread. Don't think tapas style, think buffet. There was leftovers, there was plenty to go around. Everybody ate till they were full. And there was leftovers. Jesus fed 5,000 from just a few loaves. Backtrack a little bit more. There was a deaf and a mute man. Jesus touched his tongue and he could hear and talk. Obviously, you're not amazed yet. Right before this, there was the Syrophoenician woman who had a child with an evil spirit. Culturally, this Syrophoenician woman had no business being with the people of Israel. Culturally, she was not even allowed to be in the presence of these people, and yet Jesus pursued her, went across religious lines, and gave freedom to her child. Keep rewinding with me until you're impressed. Before that, Jesus fed 5,000 with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Jesus, before that, walked on water. Sorry, is my mic on? I, I said he walked on water. There's no surface, but Jesus walked on water. There was a dead girl that came to life. Before that, there was Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem on Jesus' clothes. There's a demon-possessed man living among the tombs who was shackled that Jesus literally broke the chains off of him healed this man, released those evil spirits into a flock of pigs, and they went off of the hill because of the freedom this man was experiencing. Jesus calmed the storm that was raging around them in the sea. He calmed it with his words. He healed a paralytic when their buddies, when his buddies 
tore through a roof and lowered him down to the feet of Jesus. That man got up and walked. There was a man with leprosy. Go back to the beginning of chapter one in Mark where Jesus heals so many people. And so we walk through all of those incredible things that Jesus did. We get to chapter nine and it's almost as if Jesus is saying in this moment, don't I have a track record? Like, haven't you seen as, as you flip through all of these stories? Haven't you experienced as you've been with me in this moment? I think we've done some amazing things. I can't believe that at this moment, you don't believe that there's kingdom power to those who have faith and confidence in who I am. Today, Jesus is saying to you and to me, to us, how many times do we have to go over it? where I'll come through for you, where I have come through for you, where I I am coming through for you right now, where I will in the future. But somehow, even though he comes through for us again, the next time we face a difficulty, the default is doubt. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me that gets the, the spiritual amnesia of, God, I know you've done this in the past. I just don't know how you're gonna do it again Now, I'll take a flyer on faith occasionally. I'll pray about it. Maybe I'll actually believe that God can do something, but there's so often that we struggle and carry this doubt that God can do something in our own life. Or the doubt that God will do something in their life. The prodigal child that you have prayed for, that you've hoped for, to come home. I just don't know, God, if you're gonna... You're gonna deliver this time. And I'm not talking about being negative. I'm not talking about being pessimistic or glass has, glass hat, glass hat. I better stop. <laughs> I'm gonna say something that'll close the doors of the church. Glass half full in Jesus' name. <laughs> now you're excited. The pastor can talk. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about the message in the back of your mind that this message is not gonna make a difference. That you can't be set free from addiction, that you can't can't experience freedom and a breakthrough in spiraling sin, or or, or that this idea that that person can't be set free, they've gotta do some work in their life for Jesus to be able to love them. But what I want you to know, what I want you to experience, what I want you to understand to the core of who you are is that it does not matter what circumstances you're in. It doesn't matter where you've been. God has been moving and orchestrating to set you free. All throughout history, God has been moving to bring you back home where you belong and give you what the enemy has stolen from you. This is not some hyper-spiritualized, holy ghost, superstitious moment. This is gospel truth for you, because I never got the email that God's not still doing miracles. We live in a world where God is in charge. It's this $5 theological word called the sovereignty of God. And so what that means that God is sovereign, it means that we can't count God out at any moment, at any time, at any place, that God can set someone free from the chains of sin and darkness and brokenness. Because my Bible says all things are possible to him who believes. And yet, I know that doubt creeps in. Creeps in with you just like it does with me. Just like it did with this dad in the story. Watch what the dad says when Jesus says all things are possible for the one who believes Watch what happens. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe Help my unbelief. I love the humanity. This just real talk from the dad here. It's not, hey, of course I believe Jesus. That's why I'm standing here. It's not, yeah, 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 Jesus, I I believe you in this moment. No, it's, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Isn't that where a lot of us are today? Isn't that where a lot of us are when we find ourselves strapped and shackled by what's holding us back. God, I believe in you, but in this area, I'm struggling. 
Yes, God, I believe, but in this particular thing, I just can't see my way through. Yes, God, I'll worship you, but a long time ago, I just resigned myself to believing that this is how my life is gonna be. I'm just assuming that the rest of my life will come with this great disappointment, with this great feeling of defeat, with this depression, this darkness that won't seem to lift. Help my unbelief. And Jesus does it. Here's how he does it. Watch Watch how he does this in verse 25. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. After crying and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. If we're asking how does Jesus break the chains in our life, he does it in this way, by his truth and his triumph. Jesus has conquered hell, death, sin and the grave, but he's also spoken truth and he says you will know the truth, not your truth, you will know the truth, not their truth, not an inherited carbon copy truth, you will know the truth and Jesus says it'll set you free. This is not some magical formula. It's not a mysterious Da Vinci code that we've gotta decipher. There's no leaflet you haven't gotten. Uh, There's no pages of divine scripture that are like stuck together that uh, are just gonna bring this epiphany to you someday. No, it's Jesus triumphing over death and the grave. And it's the words of truth that Jesus has put in our hands that set you free. The question is whether or not today the rhythms of our life are operating in the triumph and the truth of Jesus. Because that, for that to happen, we, we've got to get this last verse where the disciples are wondering, they ask, why couldn't we cast out this demon? Jesus says it this way, and Jesus says to them in verse 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Some of your translations say anything but prayer and fasting, which may kind of sound like some church talk. So let's boil it down. Prayer is a lifestyle, it's a conversation, it's a consistent relationship of leaning toward God. Prayer's not a wish list, it's not a, a punch list, it's not a grocery list of things that you need to stock in the pantry of your life. No, prayer is not, Lord, please work this out for me. God, if you'll get me through this, I promise I'll get back to doing your work. Lord, if, if you'll just deliver me from this moment, I'll get back to church. No, it, it, prayer is not, hey, God, please change his mind on that. God, would you please fix the problems of my spouse? No, prayer is not, hey, Lord, uh, this Tuesday at 1130, we're going down to Mission Hospital. Oh, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, I've got a, a surgery at Mission Hospital, God, Uh, planned with uh, Dr. McMillan. Yeah, yeah, I know Dr. McMillan. I I know him. I made him. I know who's doing the surgery. Like, wouldn't that change our prayer life? God already knows what's going on. God already knows the doctor's name. He He knows the nurse's name. He knows the anesthesiologist's name. He knows the custodial crew who cleaned all of the linens and put all of the linens on your bed. God knows everything There is to know. But prayer is not a to-do list for God. It's leaning toward God with our life. And so we lean in prayer toward God, not with what we want him to do, but we lean toward who he is and who we are in him and toward what he says is true. I don't have time to unpack everything there is to, to talk about a, in, in prayer, but Gina's gonna be doing that on January 22nd. Get into that class. I'm telling you, you're, you will do better and more for your life in 2024 if you just invest in your, your prayer life. 
But Jesus here is saying, without this rhythm of leaning into God and refocusing on who he is, this chain isn't breaking. It's why Paul says in Romans 12 too, don't be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, reminding yourself that everything's possible. You see, freedom isn't about your strength. It's not about your abilities. It's not about your religious resume. Freedom is all about God's strength. It's about his ability, his resume of what he's done. But the second half of this, uh, this kind only is only gotten out by, by prayer, and, and some translations include fasting. And fasting is this whole idea of leaning away from the voice of the world. In prayer, we lean toward the voice of God. In fasting, we lean away from the voice of the world. And here's the reality. I can't feast on everything this world has and expect to grow up and be like Jesus. Let me say that again. I can't feast on everything this world is throwing at me, everything this world is offering, everything this world is inviting me to engage and buy, hook, line, and sinker. I can't feast on everything the world is offering and expect to grow up like Christ. I'm not a child of this world. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not a child of this world, you're a child of God. And fasting means we make a break at times. We take a break at times. It doesn't mean we hit the eject button. We're not called to exit the world. We're called to live in the world, just not of the world. And so fasting is this moment, not not just reserved for the spiritual elite or the professionals, but a moment for us as followers of Christ to stop being preoccupied with what's happening in the world. To stop being overwhelmed by whatever the world says is true about our life. It's a moment to shut off the phone, to, to, to shut down social media, to turn off Netflix and turn up the voice of God in our life. It's, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gonna knock out this food. I'm gonna knock out this drink. I'm gonna knock out this thing because I wanna create space where I can lean away from this and lean toward God. Listen, we have a chain breaker and his name is Jesus. And the chains that are holding you back can only be broken by Jesus. And you can experience freedom and a breakthrough today. It happens by leaning into God and away from the world. God can take the worst and bring the best. Only God. It doesn't matter what happens in our lives when it's all said and done, when there's no time left on the clock, whatever we've walked through, whatever we've worked through and endured, whatever we've seen with Jesus in the end, we win. Because there is no height nor depth, no past nor present, no angels nor demons that can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, for for those of us who are carrying burdens this morning, for those of us who feel stuck, For those of us who struggle more than anyone else knows, would you in this moment remind us that we can experience a breakthrough, that we can experience freedom? God, help us in our unbelief. Help us to trust you. Help us to believe and know and experience your goodness and your kindness. Lord, would you bring breakthroughs? Would you break chains, generational chains, situational changes? God, would you bring deliverance and breakthrough in ways that only you can? We know it's possible. 
Help us believe it's possible for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.